you talk in the book about um, the despair is you know not productive. Yeah. But there's a lot of bad stuff happening. So is this just like a mock kind of like be happy, or is this is there a no. way to not despair and 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 be realistic too? Well, I, you know, I mean, I think in light of the recent election, uh, despair is even less of an option, uh, even though it's very uh, tempting uh, for many of us at this moment in time. Um, if you despair, uh, you don't do anything. You don't change anything. Uh, maybe you eat, drink, and be merry and, and, and wait for the end. Um, despair does not uh, kind of inspire action in the same way that uh, a little bit of hope uh, might might help um, yeah. and you know let's face it if we if we get started today great um, but it's okay if we start tomorrow and that's way that's still better than uh, waiting another week but if we even get started a week from now great 10 years from now it's still better than 100 years from now right. um, so you know there's always hope it can always be a little bit better you can uh, maybe you can't stop climate change at one degree Celsius but maybe you can at two maybe at three each of those is more uh, is better than the alternative. Who who kind of encapsulates for you best uh, the spirit of this approach to the Anthropocene that isn't just what was me? I think uh, the person who encapsulates it best for me um, doesn't even know the term Anthropocene. Um, his name is uh, Fran Charway, and he is um, an environmental bureaucrat in uh, in a small coastal town in uh, China. Uh, and he has been tasked by his provincial government uh, and his local government with trying to turn a city uh, carbon neutral. So this means that they would emit no more CO2 than they also kind of took in and destroyed, which uh, is a beautiful sounding circular economy kind of concept. Turns out to be incredibly difficult in practice as, uh, as Fawn is, uh, is finding out. Um, and uh, you know, that struggle um, is the one that we're all facing. And yeah. certainly, um, it's a struggle that it, it's more important that it happened in China than, than anywhere else. And maybe India right after it. Um, because along with those curves of, uh, of uh, improvements in kind of human health and well being, uh, we've had some environmental improvement curves in this country. Now, those may be about to be reversed. <laughs> But uh, we've had some, uh, you know, the Hudson is a lot cleaner than it was even in the 80s. Oh, yeah. um, you know, we have cleaner air, uh, cleaner water, um, and that's because we decided that we didn't want killer smogs, and, and the Chinese people are, are deciding that right now, and, and perhaps the Indians will, will decide not to have killer smogs before they have them. Right. Um, well, that's this, I'm going to use the word paradox at least four more times. Before we're done, one of the other paradoxes is that in the in the in the in New York, the, the, the revival of the Hudson River, which was the first big story I wrote about in the Times when I came there in the mid '90s, um, basically it took the emergence of a big middle class that actually cared about the environment and pollution to be supportive of the bond acts, the multi-billion-dollar bond acts to build the sewage plants to cut the crap flowing into the river. Um, so you have to get a middle class that's that's big, and of course the middle class that's big is consumptive, and, and, and when you're talking about China and in India, you know, India now especially, um, which is going to be up to uh, some projection, a mid-range projection I think is about 1.7 billion by 2070 or so, um, you know, and depending on fertility rates could be a little or higher. So that, having a middle class that size, you know, and, and not overheating the planet and and especially, you know, even with what they're doing, uh, the years are living dangerously. This TV series has just started, I wrote about recently. And David Letterman goes to India, and he's like, you know, looking around, and, and he talks to Modi, and he's, they're doing this great job of expanding solar, but they're also going to double their coal use, right? Because they need electricity for their 300 million people who don't have any electricity. Exactly. So it's like that paradox just keeps coming up and up and up. Um, so uh, I don't know if you end in the end. Got your sense that we can kind of can you leave, this is the leapfrog thing you can some country do better faster uh, and don't use the mobile phone analogy no, I won't use because the phone. you know it doesn't hold up for energy but no. but but what's your sense can well, we get ahead of this like 
Uh, we haven't yet, right? China right. developed exactly the same way we did, but they did it better and faster, right? So yeah. in about 20 years, they've reached the level of pollution that it took us maybe 50 to 100 years to reach. Yeah. And they're going to clean it up much faster, it seems like. Uh, so maybe 10, 20 years from now, China will be enjoying an environment that is, uh, that is similar to, to the one that Americans enjoy. Uh, the question is, can India skip that? Yeah. No country in the world has ever industrialized without burning a ton of coal. Yeah. Um, and I tend to agree with, uh, with Stephen that uh, there's something about pyromania that's kind of baked into humanity a little bit. Um, Absolutely. There's something about fire that we really, really are attracted to that we love. It's probably on the shelves here somewhere. Lauren Isley in the 50s wrote this essay, uh, Man the Fire Maker. And he talks about progress. He says, man's long progress through history has been a climb of the heat ladder. Uh, I, there was a, I quoted that in my, my first climate book. And, and, and yeah, again, so like, can we do that? Can we escape our own pyromania? More coolly. Yeah, that's the question, right? Well, you know, you, go, you talk to anybody about India, um, and sooner or later you will uncover one of the thorium in enthusiasts, yeah. and they will tell you that uh, this is an alternative um, fuel for nuclear reactors. Um, and the people who believe in it, believe in it passionately. Yeah, just as passionately as the renewable like 2050 crowd. Yes, yeah. yes. There's something uh, religious about energy, as you well know. Uh, people kind of pick their energy source and get real religious about it. Um, it, it might be coal, and uh, you know we, we saw that uh, in this election. It might be solar. Um, it's almost a, a form of sun worship at times. And uh, it might be nuclear. People just kind of, they really passionately latch on to whatever particular form of energy they like. And then of course all the other ones are, are terrible. But it's gonna take them all, actually. 